Good morning. It's so good to see you. Good morning to those in the courts. I'm grateful we can open God's word together today. I want to acknowledge uh, it's a wonderful opportunity we had this last Wednesday evening. Uh, many of you joined us here. This room was full, the worship center, as we sought the Lord and prayed for revival in our land. It's a sweet, sweet time. Uh, God moved in amazing ways and we, we should do it again. Uh, on March the 22nd, that's a Wednesday, at the North Katy campus, we're going to have a similar prayer service, and you're welcome to join us here from the Central Campus. We will continue to have programming here at the Central Campus as normal, and then we'll see what happens in the future. But you don't have to wait on an organized time to seek the face of God, to pray, and ask the Lord to revive our land, our homes, our hearts, and I hope that we continue to do that. I'll tell you something specific that was on my heart as we were praying on Wednesday night. I just had an overwhelming burden of the fact that we are surrounded by hundreds of thousands, and depends on how wide the concentric circle goes, millions of people who are living lives, seeking fulfillment, and they're empty because they can only find that fulfillment in Jesus and they don't know Jesus. Maybe they know religion, they know of church, but they've never heard the fact that Jesus Christ paid the penalty on the cross to set them free from sin. And the reason that's such an important conviction, I think, is because I don't believe historically and even theologically that all these people are going to come to faith because I preach from this pulpit or others preach. The, the mechanism that God has commissioned is that God's people would go out and share the love of Christ with those around them. And that's what God calls us to do. And I wonder how much we're doing that. I think one of the reasons why so many people are averse to talking about what we might call evangelism or sharing the love of Jesus Christ is because it comes across as so awkward. And some of you have been presented with the idea of evangelism in a way that you're really just making a presentation, trying to close a sale as if Jesus were a juicer you're trying to sell. That's not what we see in the scripture. In fact, when Jesus commissioned us to go, he used a specific word. He said, you will be my witnesses. That means we just tell the story of what God has done in our own lives. But I'm convinced that that does not happen without one key element. The difference, the difference between a poor presentation of the gospel and a presentation that's life-changing comes down to one word. You know what that word is? It's love. It's love. That's also the reason why if you came today and you say, man, I came, he wants to talk about sharing Jesus. I don't even know Jesus. I'm just checking these things out. You came on the perfect day because what we're going to look at is the ultimate example of sharing that kind of love. And that's the love that Jesus showed. You're going to find out today how much Jesus loves you. Would you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19 as we continue this series looking at encounters with Jesus as he's on his way to the cross we're back in Jericho. If you recall, about three weeks ago, we, we saw last time at, when Jesus was on this same trip to Jericho, he healed the blind man. And, and so we have a really important uh, account here of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was so much more than the children's song that's going through your head right now, all right? <laughs> Jesus meets a man named Zacchaeus in verses 1 through 10 and tells us something very important about the love of Jesus and how we're supposed to love. You look on as I read. He entered Jericho and was passing through. There was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was not able because of the crowd since he was a short man. And just to put it in this perspective, I won't keep stopping. But we don't have to, you know, sometimes when we have a picture of a short man here, you need to understand. If you go to Israel today, there's lots of ruins from the time of Christ, from Herod's uh, construction. And so you can look at the doorways and get an idea of the height of men. Most archaeologists believe the average height of a man in the first century was five feet. So the fact that they're talking about a man here who's, uh, who's short in stature, uh, you can imagine, but we're talking about somebody noticeably short, so somewhere far south of five feet, okay? So running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus since he was about to pass that way. Now, this would make sense. You can look around West Houston. There's a lot of avenues that have trees that overhang the whole road, you know, give you shade. Now those are actually trimmed so that trucks could get through. But at that time, if they didn't trim it, it could go right out. So it's pretty innovative. I mean, Zacchaeus climbs up this tree and he could have been five, six feet from Jesus hanging over this limb when Jesus passed under. Verse five, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down because today it is necessary for me to come to, to, for me to stay at your house. 
So he quickly came down and welcomed him joyfully. All who saw it began to complain. He's gone to stay with a sinful man. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, I'll give half of all my possessions to the poor, Lord. And if I have extorted anyone, anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. Today salvation has come to this house, Jesus told him, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. What an incredible picture of love. Now, don't miss the big picture here. Remember, we've been studying this in context, the, the book of Luke. At chapter 18, remember what happened? We had all these uh, rejecting and accepting that was kind of throwing off the whole mindset of the culture at that time. We, ha- we saw Jesus rejecting those who the religious elevated, the rich young ruler. They said, oh, this guy's great. And Jesus said, no. And he walked away. He's accepting those the religious have rejected, the infants and the blind beggars. And now Jesus turns the whole thing inside out. He's receiving, of all people, Zacchaeus. He messes up the pattern that we had, right? Zacchaeus is not only a tax collector, he is the chief tax collector. That means he oversaw the tax collectors. Now, it's tax season, and most of the people in here, if we took a survey, would say, you don't love paying taxes, right? So maybe you get the idea, oh, yeah, this guy just works for the IRS. No, do not get that idea. It is not the same. What Zacchaeus is doing is unethical at best, criminal at worst. See, he has forsaken his own countrymen, Israel, and he's working for Rome, And in so doing, Rome would say, out of the districts that they they covered, they'd say, okay, you need to get so much money out of these people. And whatever you get after that, we're going to close our eyes and we're going to ignore it. And so they were sort of the mobsters of the day, if you think about it. It's, it's, It's a criminal syndicate. So let's say Zacchaeus could go in and get all his tax collectors together and say, okay, Rome requires that we get a million dollars from Jericho. Let's go ahead and try to get four or five million. I'm gonna keep a couple of those and you could disseminate the rest. He's a very wealthy man in a very wealthy city. This is a resort town at the time. And, and so... And so he's going in one of the richest cities. He's one of the richest men. And he's saying, I want to extort all these people. I want to take their money. This is not a well-loved man at all. Do you remember in chapter 18 when the rich young ruler came to Jesus, said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him, sell all you have. And he walked away sad. Remember what Jesus said? Chapter 18, verse 24, seeing that he became sad, Jesus said, how hard it is. For those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, very vivid illustration, right? Than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples asked the same thing you would. Those who heard this asked, then who can be saved? And he replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Now that's very important because that's what Jesus does in chapter 19. Do you see? We see Zacchaeus, the camel, Go through the eye of the needle, and it brings to light an entirely different level of love than we can possibly imagine. It's one thing for children to be welcomed and blind beggars to be welcomed. It's another for an old tax collector to be welcomed by Jesus. No one is less deserving than this man, and yet Jesus loves him. Church, this is how God calls you to love, to love like Jesus. I want to show you three actions of Christ's love that brought transformation to the life of Zacchaeus. And he's calling you to the same love. Now, my friends who might be watching or who are here and you know in your heart of hearts you don't know Jesus, you need to look at this through a different lens, a little bit closer, okay? Because this is how Jesus loves you. This is how much he loves you. And I show you how Jesus loved, how he's calling us to love Three loving actions towards Zacchaeus. And they're all actually found in verse 5. Look back at verse 5. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down because today it is necessary for me to stay at your house. Here's the first loving action I want you to see. Jesus demonstrates for us, he models for us a love that sees. He says, Zacchaeus. He knows him. Don't miss the contrast between others and Jesus here. The crowd grumbles. Jesus sees the need 
beyond the faults. That's what he does. Do you know what the name Zacchaeus means? It's like cruel Hebrew irony. Zacchaeus means pure one. Are you kidding me? It's like his name is uh, pure publican, um, uh, criminal. Uh, he's like holy criminal. No way. What are you talking about? Yet Jesus sees what Zacchaeus could be while he's on his way to the cross. If Zacchaeus would receive the righteousness that Christ is offering him through his death. Do you see? Jesus wants to see this man alive. Most of the people around Zacchaeus want him dead. In fact, look at the crowd's reaction. Verse 7, all who saw it began to complain, he's gone to stay with a sinful man. Would you agree, church, this might be the place where the church of Jesus Christ over the last 2,000 years has failed the most? We forget what Jesus has done for us. And as God begins to bless us and we, we grow, we, we kind of forget that we didn't do it on our own. And so we look around at people who might be far from God and we just sort of turn our noses up and say, well, I'll tell you what, I wish they'd get their acts together. You didn't get your act together. You found Jesus. That's what they need. Jesus sees beyond the fault and he sees the need. That's what God calls you to do. I have some friends, old friends in Wimberley, we were just in Wimberley yesterday visiting Atlanta's parents. I had a chance to speak at First Baptist Wimberley yesterday morning, talk about family, and uh, that was a blessing. But I was reminded of Jeannie and Joanne. Jeannie and Joanne are retired now, but for years they had a store where they restored furniture. And so what they would do, basically, they wouldn't go to the antique malls. They would go to like the junk markets or look at stuff on the side of the road or uh, uh, look at, look at uh, things that have been cast aside. They had one gift. Well, they had several, but the first was they would identify valuable junk. And then they would take that in and they would restore it beautifully. They'd create masterpieces. We have several pieces of furniture in our home that Jean and Joanne put together that are just incredible because they could see what nobody else could see. They saw value where others didn't. That's what Jesus is calling you to do. Do you see? When you say, well, not that guy, not that lady. Who in your life, when you think about it, not in history, I'm talking about right now in your life, would you say, you know, if I would be totally honest, I think that person is probably the least likely to come to faith or least qualified to receive God's grace. Who is it? Is it some classmate? Is it your boss? Is it uh, your neighbor? And you say, not, no, it's not going to happen there. That's what Jesus wants you to do is see that person as someone for whom Christ died. Mom and dad, can I talk to you for just a second? This is a very important role that you play. I recognize there's going to be days as your kids grow that you say, uh, we had an alien abduction and I didn't know it. Somebody stole my kid and replaced him with this dude because that's not my kid. I mean, he's acting a fool. He's acting like he's demon possessed and all kinds of things. You know, you've been there. All parents have been there. Let me tell you something. It is essential. You don't look past the fault and, and ignore the, the issues. You speak truth in love, but you love your kid fiercely. You don't give up on your child. When everybody else has, when they've given up on themselves, you speak life and truth and love into that kid. No one has the power in the voice that you do. Don't give up on them. You want to love like Jesus? Jesus has a love that sees. I want you to see something else in this verse. Jesus also has a love that stops. It stops. When Jesus came to the place Zacchaeus had climbed, just imagine, there's hundreds, maybe thousands around in the crowd wanting to see Jesus. He has plenty to do. And, and he looks up in the tree. I don't think Zacchaeus is that very far away from him. And it doesn't say he stopped, but he had to stop in order to do those things. Incidentally, he did the same thing in chapter 18, verse 40. Remember with the blind man, he, st he said, Jesus stopped. Jesus had to stop in order to do what he did with Zacchaeus. Now that's really important and it's very significant because Jesus had a mission to accomplish in Jerusalem. He had lots of people that wanted his attention and yet he stops for Zacchaeus. Why did Jesus stop for Zacchaeus? Jesus stopped for a desperate heart. I don't want you to miss the irony that you would have read if you're reading this in the first century. Verse four says that Zacchaeus runs on ahead. You were reading this first century, you know, uh, wealthy noblemen did not run. 
It was very undignified to run. The only other time you see running in the New Testament is you see the, the father of the prodigal son. When he sees his son, he runs. Why is it undignified? They're wearing robes, man. You have to hike that robe up, show your chi- skinny chicken legs. And, you know, it's not, not a dignified thing to do. But you know who runs? Children run. Zacchaeus runs like a child. Then in verse 4, he gets to the sycamore tree and he climbs up a tree. It's not a very dignified thing to do. But you know who climbs trees? children remember verse 18 the crowd's trying to push the infants the children away from Jesus and he says let the children come to me in fact he says that uh, in order for us to come to the kingdom that was a prerequisite the kingdom belongs to such as these Zacchaeus recognizing that everything he'd been clinging to was worthless and wasn't fulfilling he became as a child and Jesus stopped that's what we're supposed to do Folks, we talk all the time at Kingsland about going beyond. You know that's not just getting an international plane ticket and going across the ocean. That's not what it means. To go beyond means to go outside of your comfort zone. It might be across the street. It might be to go have a conversation with somebody that you least love at the office or at school. God's calling you to go beyond, to share love. And that means you have to take the time and the effort and make the sacrifice to stop Jesus didn't just stop to have a conversation with Zacchaeus. He invited himself to Zacchaeus' house. He went to his home. That's love, a love that stops. I have a a pastor friend in Austin who told me uh, something one time. I think he wrote it in a book, John Burke. But he said, Pastor, I've learned to walk and not wave. I said, what does that mean? And he said, hey, you know, you get to your house, you're exhausted after a long day, and you kind of know your neighbors and their names. You pull up in the driveway and you see the neighbor out watering his lawn or whatever, and you just kind of do this. Hey, good to see you, Harvey. How you doing, man? And you go on in the house, and it's a nice thing to do. But he said, don't wave, walk. It takes more effort. It takes stopping. But that's where real relationships start. And just when you're about to say, hello, you say, well, wait, I can wait. And I'm going to walk across the street and say, man, Harvey, how's it going? How's the family? How was vacation a couple weeks ago? Tell me what's going on. As you get to know him, how, how can I pray for you? You see, something happens when we have a different kind of love than the world has. A love that stops. That's what God's calling us to do here. In fact, you know, we started the year with a a card that said, who's your seven? Remember that? We had Awake in West Houston. Some of you, when you walked in today, I hope you received one of these cards. It says, who's your seven? And you might have thought, Pastor, you know that campaign is over. Yeah, it is. But I think this is the most important time maybe to revisit this. We're going to revisit it all year long. If you've been around Kingsling, you know, we're asking the Lord that we might see one million seven homes transformed by the power of the gospel. Not just at Kingsland, but, but through what we can do, what we can offer even other churches and other places. But the reason we have that seven on there is we recognize that each of us can take ownership of seven households that we might pray for and care for and love. And so I want you to take this home and revisit that between now and Easter. The reason I gave you a new one, you can use the old one, but I want to encourage you maybe to consider the specific households God's calling you not only to pray for, but to care for and to love, to stop for. They might not even be here local. They might be somebody in another state or a family member that God's put on your heart. That the Lord says, I, you, I, the Lord's given me a burden to share the love of Christ with that person, that individual. You might also, maybe you had one for your whole household. Maybe each individual has one. There might be a lot of overlap, but you begin to pray and, and seek the Lord and then look for ways to love them well. Who's your seven? You know, Jesus knew his name. And I think we often assume that Jesus knew Zacchaeus' name because he's God. He is. So it's reasonable to presume that. But there might be a more practical reason why Jesus knew his name. You know, Jesus had a disciple who used to be a tax collector. I wonder whether Matthew sometime over dinner didn't say, hey, Jesus, next time we'll go through Jericho, I want you to meet a guy I used to know from my old line of work. He's a wee little man. (laughs) But I have to tell you, he looks pretty empty. Like he's, he's tried everything. He's filthy rich and he's, he's hurting. Maybe we could talk to him. I think Jesus knew his name for other reasons. What we do know is that his life was completely changed because Jesus stopped. You want to love like Jesus? 
That's a love that sees. That's a love that stops. And I also want you to see that's a love that saves. Now, I recognize that you don't have saving power, but you have the message that can bring salvation. You have the witness of how Christ has changed your life. And if you don't, you have the opportunity to come to faith even today. This is a love that saves. Look back at verse 5. The gospel is found in three words in verse 5 that you might have missed. It says, it is necessary that I come to your house. Jesus did not say, I want to come to your house. Jesus said, I must come to your house today. Now, why did Jesus must come to his house? Why? We get the answer in verse 10, the mission statement of Jesus. For the Son of Man has come that, uh, to seek and to save that which is lost. To seek and to save the lost. That's why he came. Incidentally, that's why we're still here, to do the same, a love that saved. Jesus loved you so much, he gave his life for you. He sought you. He did everything necessary for your life to be transformed. And Zacchaeus realizes his whole reason for living is Jesus, and he announces. You see that? Lord, I give half my goods to the poor, and and if I've wronged anyone, I'll pay them back four times what I owe. Incidentally, he was not saved because he gave these things. No. This is evidence that he was saved. He, he wasn't saved because he gave. He gave because he was saved. Do you understand? God had changed his life. And he demonstrated this because he recognized everything else was empty. You know what's really interesting about that statement that he made? If Zacchaeus, who's filthy rich, gave half what he owed to the poor, that's above and beyond. And then he said, and if I've wronged anybody, if I've extorted them, I'll pay them back four times. You think word might have gotten out? I mean, there's, there's ads posted all over Jericho. If you've been injured by Zacchaeus, call this number. There's a long line of people trying to get four times from Zacchaeus. You know what I think? I, don't, I mean, I don't have evidence here, but it's a strong implication. Remember the rich young ruler? Jesus said, sell all you have, give it to the poor, and then follow me. I think Zacchaeus might have fulfilled the offer that Jesus made the rich young ruler. He might have lost everything, and he did not care because he gained everything that mattered. Do you see? That's what the love of Jesus Christ can do. Listen, when someone comes to faith in Christ, a miracle takes place. We get so excited about other miracles when somebody says, you know, there was an answer to prayer. There was a miracle. I pray we get just excited about that miracle, that someone moves from death to life. Because of Jesus Christ. One last thought, kind of a big picture thing I noticed about this passage that I had not noticed before. I wanted to learn a little bit more about the sycamore tree. You know, did, did Zacchaeus need a boost to get up there? Like, how did it work? And you, you can go to Jericho. I've seen sycamore trees there, not the sycamore. If you go to Jericho, you can get a bad tour guide who will tell you that's the sycamore tree Jesus, or that Zacchaeus climbed. It's not true. It's not true. But I'll tell you what. I know he climbed it. Here's what I did find out that was more interesting. Maybe you knew this already. The sycamore trees that are found in the Middle East are not the same as the sycamore trees that we have. They're actually sycamore fig trees. Did you know that? You say, who cares, pastor? (laughs) Here's why. All through the Old Testament, a clear reference to Israel in a plant is the, the fig tree. The fig tree is used as a symbol for Israel. Let me give you a couple of examples. Hosea 9, I discovered Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your ancestors like the first fruit of the fig tree in its season. See the same thing in Joel, 7, Joel 1, 7. So I won't bore you with that, but what I want you to understand is the fig tree was a picture of the fruit to the nations that would offer this fruit and then it would go forward and give life to those around. A fig tree. And in the Old Testament, several references are to sycamore fig trees as well. It's a more bitter fruit than the, the, the smaller fig trees, but nevertheless, it's used and harvested. So this is why it's interesting. Jesus is going to reference the fig tree a lot in the next few days after this passage as he goes toward the cross. He's going to go up into Jerusalem. Remember, he's going to curse the fig tree. Why? Because this fig tree looks beautiful, but it has not bearing any fruit. And it's such a picture of Israel, right? Israel was given the Messiah, rejected the Messiah. And so there was no fruit, even though it looked good. We we also remember uh, there's a parable of the fig tree just a couple chapters later in the book of Luke. I just wonder, could it be just before Jesus goes to the cross 
And he curses that fig tree, recognizing Israel has rejected her Messiah. That Jesus goes to a fig tree and plucks fruit from that fig tree that is the most despised of Israel, the one the least likely to be converted by the Messiah and saved. And he says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. That's the love that Jesus has offered us. You know what? Sometimes we think, well, that guy could never be saved. And the reality is, if we're honest, if you want to know the person least likely to be saved, you're looking at him. Go look in a mirror, you're looking at her or him. None of us deserve it. That's the love that Jesus has shown us. And that's the love that we have the opportunity to show others around us. Do you see? A love that sees what no one else can. A love that stops long enough to get uncomfortable and enter into somebody else's life. A love that shares the saving power that comes through Christ alone. Would you bow with me, church? I'm going to pray for us. God, thank you for the power of your holy word. Holy Spirit, I invite you to stir our hearts right now to give us promptings. And what's next? What should we do next with this? And Father, first of all, I pray that if there's a man or woman within the sound of my voice who does not know you, that today they would recognize the overwhelming love that you have shown them and they would receive the grace that you offer through Jesus Christ. They repent of their sins and they'd recognize their own inability to be saved and they would trust you. God, for those of us who have trusted you, who are saved, Lord, forgive us when we grow callous toward the lostness and the desperate need of those around us. Lord, help us and show us to love like you've loved. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Pastor Ryan Rush here, and I just want to thank you for being with us at Kingston Online today. What an honor. But I'll tell you what would be even better. We'd love to see you get connected with the physical church in the days ahead, if you haven't already. And that means maybe if you're local in the West Houston area, we'd love to see you at Kingsland. Otherwise, regardless, we'd love to help you facilitate uh, jumping into a local church near you, and we can do that together. You can go to kingsland.org slash online connect. kingsland.org slash online connect to find out next steps on your journey. Listen, thanks again for being with us today at Kingsland Online.